Welcome to Macro Musings, the podcast series where each week we pull back the curtain and take a closer look at the important macroeconomic issues of the past, present, and future. I'm your host, David Beckworth of the Mercatus Center. We are glad you've decided to join us. Our guest today is Rob Kaplan. Rob is the president and CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas. Previously, he was a professor and associate dean at Harvard Business School, and prior to that, he was a vice chairman of Goldman Sachs. Rob joins us today to talk about his career, the Dallas Fed, and U.S. monetary policy. Rob, welcome to the show. Thanks. Good to be here, David. Well, it's a real treat to have you on. And with all my guests, I always start off by asking them, how did they get into economics, into macro, and in your case, the Federal Reserve? What was your career path that led you to the Fed? Well, I was an investment banker for 23 years, as you know, at uh, at Goldman Sachs. And then I actually took a leave of absence to teach leadership at Harvard Business School. Uh, And I enjoyed it so much, I went back to the firm and I formally resigned and then wound up staying at Harvard for uh, close to 10 years, first as an instructor, then as a professor, and then as a professor and a senior associate dean. Um, And so uh, what happened was uh, in 2015, uh, the Dallas Fed was doing a search for a new CEO. And um, I got a phone call from uh, one of the board members and um, asked me whether I would consider doing this. And uh, I I thought about it, came down and talked to them, and they offered me the job relatively quickly. But – uh, I guess it was sort of a circuitous route, but I, I always wanted to do public service. And, and when the opportunity to come to the Fed came up, I uh, jumped on it and thought it was a great way to do public service. Yes. Now, I read in your bio, you grew up in Kansas. Is that correct? I did. Yes. So all the way from Kansas to the halls of power at the Federal Reserve. <laughs> yes, something like that. Yes. Yeah. Now, I, I mentioned Kansas because I was born in Kansas as well. And we had a previous guest on. Uh, Brad Setzer, who's from Kansas. We have a lot of uh, recent Kansas guests, which is great. Now, you've written a lot of interesting books on leadership, self-growth. You're the dean at Harvard Business School, so you know management, personal development. And I'm curious, because you have a unique perspective on that at the Federal Reserve. So how do you view the Fed through the lens of your, your business and management skills? Well, first of all, I'd say uh, institutions in this country – and in the world generally, but certainly in the United States, are very critical. It's very important that our institutions work effectively. And having a a strong institutional framework allows people to innovate, run businesses, do all the other things that we do freely because our institutions are strong. I think the Fed is one of those important institutions in the United States. So um, historically, the leadership of the Fed has been not wholly, but heavily comprised of uh, PhD economists. And so I'm one of the few business people around the table, but we do have a few of them. And I think in terms of leadership of this institution, having a mix of uh, PhD economists, as well as people who've been in the business world and in the private sector or other walks of life, I think that diversity of backgrounds is very valuable and makes for better leadership. And and then um, there's a whole range of things going on at the Fed that the Fed uses me on, on how to, uh, how to make sure that whatever it is we're doing, we, we do monetary policy, we do research, we do supervision of the banks in the United States, yep. we oversee payments, and we are an operator, and we do treasury services, uh, cash management, uh, and, and all those things. I think the, the things I've learned as a business person in terms of adding value that's distinctive, uh, setting priorities, figuring out where you're out of alignment and getting into alignment. All the, I brought all those practices to the Fed, uh, and I think, uh, I think they're all applicable here. All right. Very interesting. Now, I'm curious, what is it like in a typical day in the life of a Federal Reserve president? So you're at the Dallas Fed. What does your typical day begin like and end with? Well, uh, it's fair to say that at any moment in uh, in the day, uh, I've already got in the back of my mind uh, trying to understand what's going on in the economy, 
in Texas, New Mexico, Louisiana, and the economy in the United States, as well as the economy globally. And so I'd say at all times in this job, I'm talking uh, when I'm talking to business leaders, I'm talking to other leaders, I'm talking to economists. I'm always spending part of my time trying to figure out what's going on in the economy and what are the out, what's the outlook. Um, so I probably spend on a typical day, I'm talking to our research people. I'm probably talking to 30 CEOs a month. So I'm doing several calls a day that are scheduled. Uh, I'm also then, there's some management aspects of this job. So I chair budgeting for the Fed, uh, uh, spending stewardship. I'm spending time on that. And then probably a whole range of other people, leadership and management issues in managing the 1,300 people at the Dallas Fed and also being involved in a lot of managing a lot of the activities we've got going on uh, in the Federal Reserve System generally. So it's a mix of those things on any given day. And then a good part of my time, I'm out in the community speaking and also learning uh, about what's going on in the economy. Well, you've got a full plate there juggling a lot of different responsibilities. You mentioned the part about staying informed about the U.S. economy, and I'm curious, in, in addition to your in-house advisors, your economists that you turn to, where do you like to go for news market analysis? So there's favorite newspapers, magazines, news shows you like to turn to? So – I look at everything, but it starts with uh, when I get up in the morning, I'm probably watching the same uh, cable news shows everybody else is on CNBC and Bloomberg uh, uh, and others. Okay, Uh, I'm reading The Times, The Wall Street Journal and the FT every single morning. Uh, I'm watching uh, the Dow Jones Wire, Bloomberg uh, during the day for news stories. And I'm also watching the markets. Um, And so that pattern I probably follow every single day. And then and then I'm talking, as I said, to people in in industry, CEOs about what are trends that are going on that I might not be reading about in the paper or seeing in the markets. So based on all that, I'm, I'm trying to form a pretty good picture of uh, of what I think is going on out there and what's likely to happen in the future. Yeah, that's a pretty big volume of, of news absorption. <laughs> you're taking yeah, on. no, I'm 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 consuming a lot. I'm used yep. to it. It's, I've done it for my whole career, but I'm consuming a lot every day, and that's uh, deliberate. Yeah, so I'm curious. One of the, the new um, facets or mediums for getting news is Twitter. There's a lot of interesting conversations that go on there in real time. It's, also, it's kind of a news wire for some folks, but it's also a conversation platform for others. And I know some Fed officials look, some participate. Do you see any value in Twitter for your job? Well, I'll just tell you, uh, when I was a professor at Harvard, I used Twitter to post uh, speeches I gave and articles I wrote. Mm-hmm. I, I I seldom made a comment on it. I usually just posted uh, uh, something I did or an interview I did. And I use it the same way at the Fed. I think it's a, for me, it's a good distribution okay. method where if I speak or if I write something, we put it on Twitter. I, I probably personally don't use it to converse with people because it's too limiting. And in, in this job, I think uh, a sound bite that short uh, may not lend itself to the right. kind of work that I'm doing. Right, right. It has the potential to blow up. Um, I want to ask about FOMC meetings. Can you walk us through what it's like to prepare to get on the plane when you're actually in the conversation at the FOMC? What, what, what is it like? So we normally start uh, in a way I'm always preparing for FOMC because of my work in trying to understand the economy and thinking about monetary policy. But I'd say formally, we usually start our formal preparation for the FOMC about two, two and a half weeks before the meeting. And that's we have a process here that I work on with our research department where they're preparing briefings on the local economy, the national economy, international, a number of then specific topics like uh, what's going on in the financial sector, banks, et cetera. And so they're working on that. Uh, At the same time, I'm making a number of outward calls to a range of business leaders, community leaders, uh, some economists, some people in the markets, just to try to understand what what their insight is as to what's going on now. And that all comes to a head at the end of the week, right before FOMC, where I'll, I'll make notes then on what I think I want to say at the FOMC 
in terms of my analysis of the economy. And also, I will have worked with our research department here to debate what the appropriate path is for monetary policy. And then I'll, I'll write some notes uh, on Friday before to jot down my views. And then I'll get to uh, DC on Monday. We'll usually have committee meetings on Monday among the Fed bank presidents and the governors. And then we'll start the FOMC on, on Tuesday. And, uh, and I'd say everyone around the table has their own process. But one thing we all have in common, I think we get to that table, we're all extremely well prepared and to spend a substantial amount of time preparing, which makes it a very valuable process. Yeah. Now, do you bring staff with you? Do they get to sit around the table when you're at the table? I mean, behind the table? Yeah, I always bring uh, usually our chief economist or some senior economist from the bank. Sometimes we rotate it. Yeah. And uh, like a lot of things at the at the Fed and the FOMC, it's pretty choreographed. So there is a there's a seat that's been the seat for the president of the Dallas Fed, which has been our seat for a long, long time around the table. And then around the outside of the table, there's an assigned seat for uh, the economist that comes from the Dallas Fed. And they will always sit in that seat. Is that by chance Evan Koenig? Does he get to go on this? Trip? It's. It's Evan or it's now Mark Giannone. Okay. And we try – one thing we've tried to do is rotate uh, our senior economists so that they have a chance to see what goes on at FOMC. And I think it, it, it's, a, it's a great experience. And so we're trying to make sure our senior people uh, get, a, get exposure to that. Okay. Now, when you're in the FOMC and you're discussing what to do next, and let's say there's a disagreement, say one person – Maybe maybe the majority wants to move one direction and someone else is dissenting. They think another direction is appropriate. How are such disagreements handled? Well, I would say that uh, here in the Dallas Fed and also at the FOMC, I, I, I'm hopeful that there'll be disagreements. Okay. So uh, what we all come prepared to do is independently give our views. Um, sometimes our views around the table at the FOMC are the same, similar, and sometimes we disagree. And when we disagree, we discuss why we disagree and debate it. And I think that's the most valuable part of the process. I I think I'd be disappointed if there is too much agreement around the table. Uh, so, uh, I think it's very important. And I think we have a culture at the FOMC where a disagreement is welcome and encouraged and what we do, though, is debate it out and we all learn from it and we all reserve their right to be persuaded uh, or to change our minds. And I think that's that's one of the big values of the FOMC process. So there is this perception, though, that when the final vote is cast, that it, it's good to maybe to some extent put on a unified front. Is, is that true? I mean, even if you disagree, you vote because you want to you know, send a, a clear signal I know there's been dissents, but is there ever the time where maybe you, you, you say, okay, I'll vote now, you know, but maybe I have some misgivings about it? So here's my approach, and I'm probably a good repre- – I'm probably representative. Uh, if I'm – on any one decision, I may either have great conviction and feel very strongly. Mm-hmm. Uh, and my job, by the way, before the FOMC meeting is, in my opinion – to share those views with others around the table, and then ultimately the week before with the chairperson, either Janet Yellen or Jay Powell. And if I disagree with where we're going, I'm going to work hard to try to convince them of my position, and they're going to debate back. Uh, And so by the time I've walked into the meeting, I've already expressed my views, and to the extent I had disagreement, I've expressed them. And if I have strong enough conviction, I would not be averse to – I would not be averse at all to dissenting. Turns out so far I have not. But uh, listen, I come from a business background. And what I learned in business is um, you don't wait till the meeting to disagree. You in the lead up, you give your views. And sometimes in my experience here, I've been able to persuade others around the table to moderate their views. And sometimes I've disagreed. And through their arguments, they persuade me, persuaded me I should moderate my views. So uh, I, I would say for me, I have not worried too much about presenting a united front after we leave the meeting. Okay, um, I, I've been very free. And I think most around the table 
have feel very free to express their views, including if they're uncomfortable or disagree with certain aspects of what we're doing. And, and I, I think that's a very positive thing. We're, we're pretty transparent. So we do a summary of economic projections. You make so-called dot plot. Yep. So we submit our views on what the outlook is for GDP growth, unemployment, what we think the appropriate range is for the Fed funds rate. And, and you know, there's some consensus, there's a median, but there's outliers. And I think when we leave the meeting, and I certainly do feel free to explain why I might be an outlier on certain things and explain why. And I think, uh, I think that's very positive and it's, it, it, it's very transparent. So, no, I don't say anything publicly that I wouldn't say privately uh, in the meeting. Oh, very interesting. So there's some discussion that goes on before the actual meeting so everyone knows where the other participants are coming from. Um, and, then, and you say that's an important part of the process. I, th- I think so. Listen, the Fed presidents, we're getting together frequently apart from FOMC because we're doing work on uh, other operating aspects of the Fed. Okay. We work on a bunch of committees. Um, but I'm, I, it's not unusual that if I have a different view on what the neutral rate is or the outlook for the economy or some other issue, including regulatory issue, I'll call a few other presidents and, and bat it around. Uh, I've called governors in the past and, and bat it around. And, um, and no, I think that's very healthy. We are a very, I, I think the, this group, I was about to say cohesive and collegial. Uh, this, this group works very well, I think, together as a group. And even though there's new participants, you know, some people are retiring, new participants are rolling in. Uh, I think there's a culture that, that we work together very, very well. We, we independently express our own views and do our own independent work, but we also um, learn from each other and listen to each other. Very interesting. One of the areas you just mentioned is the regulatory front, the part of your responsibility dealing with bank regulation. And there's also the state bank charter. So the you know, state of Texas has its own bank regulators. So I'm wondering, how do you interact with them? Or does it does the Board of Governors interact more with them than you? Well, so we are involved in supervising the banks, for example, in the state of Texas. In the lingo, supervision is a quote unquote delegated function. Okay. In that uh, the big policy decisions are ultimately made at the Board of Governors, uh, but that doesn't keep us from having extensive discussions about them. Uh, and then our job in the in the districts is to implement these policies. Uh, and so and we do a lot of the work we do in coordination with the Board of Governors. So I would say this is a shared um, a shared activity. Uh, with different aspects of it uh, being delegated to one party or the other. Okay. Well, let's move on to the actual um, stance of monetary policy. The decisions have been recently made. Just this September, the FOMC met, and it raised uh, another quarter, um, 25 basis points. And it looks like there's going to be some more going forward. And if you calculate them all in, the ones next year, the ones still remaining this year, it could put the target rate, interest rate, in the low to mid 3% range. And I'm curious if you're comfortable with that um, destination. So here's what I've said publicly. Okay. And this is a good example, maybe what we were talking about earlier. Uh, each of us is part of submitting our views, but each of us you know, separately articulates you know, what we submitted. So let me explain. I have said that uh, my own judgment is we're meeting our dual mandate right now, meaning full employment. Uh, and uh, we are at or past full employment in the United States, in my view. Uh, that doesn't mean there isn't some more labor slack. There might be. But I think we probably have, are meeting our full employment mandate. I wouldn't have said that two or three years ago, but I would say it today. Uh, and we are also meeting our price stability objective, in my view. We have a stated objective of a 2% uh, medium-term PCE target. And right now, uh, based on all the work that we're doing at the Dallas Fed, we believe we're, we're, uh, we're meeting that uh, 2% objective. So my own view is when you're meeting your dual mandate, it's appropriate 
to be adjusting the stance of monetary policy to something closer to at least a neutral stance. Neutral means uh, there's we've been accommodative at the Fed for the last literally eight or nine years. And I think we're getting to the point now where uh, I think the economy no longer needs the Federal Reserve to be accommodative. Um, this would be akin to I'm not suggesting we put our foot on the brakes, but I do think we should be at least at the Fed taking our foot off the accelerator. OK. Um, and so my own assertion is neutral and there's disagreement. And I think that's appropriate around the table. My own best guess as to what the neutral rate is probably revolves around something in the range of two and a half to two and three quarters. But I would emphasize that's inherently imprecise. It could be a little higher than two and three quarters. It could be a little lower. And so uh, I, I, what, I, what I've submitted uh, in the um, dot plot probably calls for us to get to a destination where maybe the ultimate uh, rate we get to is closer to two and three quarters to 3%. Some uh, are higher, some are lower in that submission, but that's in the, that's the neighborhood as to where I am. So you'd be a little bit lower than the median that we now see in the summary of economic projections. It depends on which year. I think, uh, okay. I, 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 I'll let you refer to that, but, but what I've said is I'm comfortable with, uh, one additional raise in December. Uh, I'm comfortable. And I think my base case is that we would raise at least a couple of times next year. Uh, but if you if you if you did that, that would get us uh, in the range of two and three quarters to three percent. We're two to two and a quarter right now. And if we raised once more in December and then one twice more next year, that would get us in the range of two and three quarters to three uh, percent. And I, I so far do not have a view that we should go beyond that. I might change my mind by the time we get to next spring or summer and articulate a view that we need to do more. But at this juncture, I'm not ready to make that judgment. Sure, that makes sense. You know, what's interesting, you mentioned the neutral rate. You know, what is, what is the value? There's differing views upon it. It was interesting just these past few days, past week or so, um, Fed Chair Jay Powell is, is kind of, I don't say distanced himself, but he, he's definitely recognized there's ambiguity surrounding the estimate of it. Kind of, kind of the moving targets, they're hard to yes. pin down. And then uh, President of the New York Fed, John Williams, had a speech where he came out and just kind of said, look, we, we have to be less focused on this R-star, this, this neutral rate measure. After it being so important, it seems like, for the past few years, he's kind of downplaying its importance. So I'll, I'll give you my own interpretation. I think it might be a little different than the premise of your question. What I would say and what I did, what I have said is, we ought to be recognizing, and we have all along, that the neutral rate is inherently uncertain. In the same way, our best judgment on the full employment rate is inherently uncertain. Okay. okay? Mm -hmm. And so just it's, it's not like I can look at the 10-year treasury and I can see a rate. The neutral rate is by its nature uh, in a range and has some ambiguity. And I think we're wise to recognize that. Having said that, that doesn't mean we don't still have to make a judgment about it. In the same way, when you're approaching an intersection and you've got your foot on either the brake or the accelerator, you've got to make a judgment about how fast you're going and what your rate of speed needs to be as you approach that intersection. You know what I mean? That's a good Understanding analogy. that it's, yep. not, it's, not a, it's not an exact science. So I, I think it's appropriate to uh, caution that these estimates are uncertain and that as a result, uh, and I'll let, he, I'll let John Williams and, and Jay Powell speak for themselves, but what I, what I took to take our comments to mean is as a result, in our statement, I don't think it's useful at this point to be uh, commenting on whether or not we're accommodative. I think it was useful for the last eight or nine years. I think it's less useful now. And I think the other thing that's worth commenting on as we get toward our best estimate of neutral we're going to, there's going to be a little bit more uncertainty, which is another way of saying, I think when you're highly accommodative, I don't, I think it's, it's clear that you should be raising the fed funds rate and moving toward neutral as you get toward neutral. 
given the neutral estimate is uh, got a band around it is uncertain, you know, you have to realize it's not going to be an exact science It's going to be imprecise. And we should just recognize that. And, and I think that's the way I would frame this. That's fair enough. And that seems reasonable. And also, it's, I think it's, it's maybe a little um, early to dismiss the R star completely because it's still going to be in all the models, implicitly in all the Phillips curve thinking. It's still there. It's just you guys are being more nuanced, as you just suggested with it. Yeah. And I would say to you, I don't foresee a time where I'm going to dispense with uh, trying to think about R star. I think it's, a, it's an integral part of uh, monetary policy. But having said that, I'm never going to attach undue precision to that. And I'm always going to be very aware and always emphasize this is highly precise. It's subject to revision. Uh, uh, We might move our estimate up or down of our start. and, And let's just put it in context. Okay. Along those lines, do you have any concerns about inverting the yield curve? Yeah. So I would say two things on that. Number one, in terms of when I look at the yield curve today, what I see, and this is I'm speaking as somebody who spent a good part of my career in the markets, the one and the two-year treasury, I think, pretty heavily reflect what the Fed has said it's going to do on the Fed funds rate. Okay. In other words, we've been pretty transparent, and I think it. it I think you see a lot of what we said reflected in the one and the two-year rates. And a and good example of what I just said is we raised the Fed funds rate last week, and I don't think you saw the uh, one or two year treasury rate move at all. Or they moved, they, they did not move in response to that, which tells me it's in the market. The 10 year treasury is another matter. The 10 year treasury is not as heavily determined by the Fed because we, we set the short rate. It's heavily determined by supply demand factors and, and it's market determined. And I think the 10-year treasury is telling me that uh, there's a lot of global liquidity, which keeps down the the 10-year rate and the 30-year rate. But it also tells me that expectations of future growth are somewhat sluggish. Okay? So um, the curve is flattening as a result of that. I do believe that it's very important to pay attention to the curve. I, for one, would not want to knowingly invert the uh, U.S. Treasury curve. Uh, I wouldn't. Others might disagree with me. And here's why I wouldn't want to do it. For, for me, one, yes, historically, it's been a pretty good forward indicator of future recession. But for me, the bigger issue is if you have an inverted uh, yield curve, and I mean, if it's materially inverted and inverted for an extended period of time, what that means is financial intermediaries, lenders, Mm-hmm. Who are their business is to borrow short and lend long. If they cannot borrow short and lend long and make a spread because of an inversion, in other words, it, you get paid more to t- take shorter risk than longer risk. I think that ultimately, uh, in my experience, is going to have an, a, an impact on tightening financial conditions. And it doesn't surprise me that historically, when there's been an inversion, it usually has led to tightening financial conditions ultimately and a slowing in the economy if it if it persists. And so that's why I think it's worth continuing to pay attention to and not discounting. And flattening flattening might be fine, but if you actually have an inversion, uh, a, a material inversion for an extended period of time, I, I for one uh, would view that as something I'm going to watch very, very carefully, and that'll be a factor in my decision making. Yeah, that's a great point. The yield curve can go from being a predictive tool to an actual causal agent for financial intermediation if, if the inversion is big enough, as you suggested. Yeah. So let's move on then to some other interesting topics. And these are bigger questions as the Fed moves forward this year and next year. And there, there's two I have in mind. The first one is the future of the Fed's operating system. So right now, the Fed with its large balance sheet is running a floor system. But if the Fed's balance sheet were to continue to to shrink, their bank reserves continue to uh, get smaller and smaller, at some point, if if this was left unchecked, the Fed would be kind of pushed back into a corridor system like they had before 2008. Now, I think it would be a little bit different because you would still have interest and excess reserves, but it would be be more of a corridor system. Or alternatively, the Fed could stay with the floor system and kind of end that runoff of the balance sheet. Do you have a 
a view of which operating system you'd prefer to see in the future? Well, I, I think this is an example of something where I think it just pays to have an open mind. We're we're running we're running down gradually the Fed's balance sheet. Uh, I'm watching very carefully how the markets are reacting to that. Yep. I'm watching very carefully the mechanic on how the Fed funds rate is set. And we're we're making, I think, ongoing judgments and trying to assess and learn from this process about, you know, how much reserves are actually needed in the financial system. I think it's a little too soon to judge. Okay. My get my guess, my guess is we're gonna wind up uh, ultimately with a continuation of the current system of a floor system. But I've got an open mind on that. I, I'm not sure I see a scenario where reserves uh, decline enough and our balance sheet runs down enough where we return to the old corridor system. Uh, but I'm open-minded. But my uh, but but the most important thing between now and over the next months and years is to is just to be learning from what we're seeing and trying to make an assessment as to as to how much reserves are needed and what the appropriate system is. So you view this issue from. Let's see what balance sheet makes them what size of the balance sheet makes the most sense and then and then what's the implications for the operating system as opposed to what operates operating system would I like and then find the balance sheet that fits it is that fair? Yes, that's very fair. That's a, uh, absolutely okay. right. Okay. All right. So you're not preset on an operating system. You no. you more you more want to see what what amount of reserves do you think the system needs and go right. from there. Right. Like a, like a lot of things we should be adapting our approach to what the needs are of the financial system. Okay. All right. So the second um, big point of conversation, and one that's near and dear to my heart, and the reason I mentioned Evan Koenig, because I know it's near and dear to his heart, is the actual monetary regime. So right now the, the Fed has an inflation target, has a dual mandate, as you mentioned, but also it's an inflation target. There's been a lot of discussion about, you know, should we look at something different, a price level target, a temporary price level target, a nominal GDP level target, that'd be my one I, I, I would check. Or maybe even inflation targeting with a, a range, like 1% to 3%. And I know you, Evan is a, is a fan of nominal GDP targeting, if, at least he has been. Yeah. And I'm wondering what, what your thoughts are. If, if you, you know, could reset the system, and I, and I know part of the problem is it takes time to change an institution, change market expectations. But if you had a clean slate, what regime would you pick? Well, and you're right. Uh, getting from here to there, if we're going to make changes, is is a very tricky thing because we've conditioned the markets and the public right. to expect a certain type of framework and reaction function from us. Uh, having said that, I do think it's a, a healthy thing. I do believe we should be stepping back and re-reviewing our, uh, our regime. Uh, and I think we should be doing that in the future on some regular basis. But I think that's a healthy thing, and and I'm hopeful that we'll be doing that at the Federal Reserve. Uh, of all these approaches, and obviously I live here in Dallas with Evan, uh, <laughs> I, I probably – I mean the nominal GDP targeting has a lot of appeal in that it, it takes into account inflation. It takes into account growth. Um, and the, the other thing is we are a very highly leveraged country, and l l it's nominal GDP – that services our debt. That's right. In other words, you need to generate nominal GDP right. to service the debt. The, there are some ch challenges, though, with this approach and others, which I actually would like to see as debate. And so what's an example? How to explain nominal GDP targeting uh, in, in that you're, there's sort of a catch-up mechanism in nominal GDP targeting if, uh, and, and a lot of other aspects that I think are not going to be easy to communicate. The The good news about the current framework is it's relatively straightforward to communicate. That's fair. Uh, so I, I, my main objective, I don't have a conclusion. I would like to see us uh, have a formal review, look at all these different options. And uh, the, the other comment people have asked me, would you like to raise the inflation target? And my so so far, I'm open to uh, examining that but my so far, I'd be reluctant in that we've set a two percent inflation target. We've been running famously behind it for many years. We're not right now meeting it, uh, I, and I'm I'm a little hesitant 
to want to further change the, that target, uh, especially um, at this stage in the economic cycle. Uh, and also, uh, um, you know, you rings in the question, if you change the target, you have the tools to achieve that target. And while we've got a lot of cyclical inflation pressure right now, I think a, a lot of forces out there right now are, in fact, deflationary, globalization, automation. But my main thing, again, that's a long-winded way of saying I don't have a conclusion on these things. Probably nominal GDP targeting would be at the top of my list. But I'd like to see all these various approaches uh, examined, debated, and a, and a good process to be reviewing this. Do you think the other members of the, of the FOMC are as open as you are to these alternative approaches? Well, I, as a practice, I normally don't try to speak for the whole committee. Okay. But, I, but you, you've seen, I think, a number of statements from others around the table mm -hmm. that have expressed an openness. Uh, and, and I think uh, that includes presidents and governors. And so uh, I, I'm hopeful that this, this is something okay. we should do, even if the end of it, we make no changes at all. I just think the process, listen, I come from the corporate sector and the business sector, and I'm accustomed to re-reviewing your governance, your frameworks, your approaches, and doing that on some regular basis. I think that's a healthy thing. And I started this conversation about the importance of institutions in this country. I think I think one of the things that's that preserves and builds institutions and confidence in institutions is a is an observed willingness to re-examine how we do things and update those things. All right, fair enough. This is about the 10-year anniversary of the financial crisis, and as a member of the Federal Reserve, I wonder what your thoughts are on the lessons uh, from this crisis. Well, there's a number of them, but the most important for me is um, probably two things. Number one, before 2008 or so, the Fed did not have, we did not have uh, stress testing uh, of the big banks. Um, uh, and in particular, uh, what I mean is we looked at capital, we looked at other features, but, I, but I've learned by being a, formerly being a banker, capital alone may not tell you that much unless you stress test it. And what we learned out of the crisis is there were a whole series of derivatives, contingent liabilities, tail risk, credit default swaps being an example of that, where we didn't, I don't think the Fed uh, recognized the degree of leverage in the system because we didn't run stress tests. So I, I want to make sure going forward from here, we we can re-review capital requirements, regulations for small, mid-sized banks, but I think it's very critical that we keep very tough capital requirements and stress testing uh, for our big banks. Second lesson is as much as we do a good job on the banks, uh, a lot of the financial risk in the system is in the non-bank financials. It's away from the banking system. It's in the so-called shadow financial system. And I think what we learned in, uh, in the crisis was we don't have great visibility on the shadow system. A lot of the worst practices which help lead to the crisis, including writing an excessive amount of credit default swaps, happen not in the banks but in the non-bank financials. And so I'm a little concerned as I sit here today to make sure that we monitor and it won't be at the Fed because we don't have we don't have uh, oversight on non-bank financials. But I think our other institutions and oversight uh, groups, SEC and others, need to be watching very carefully uh, the non-bank financials because uh, we've learned historically a lot of the excesses and leverage including in derivative form, can build out in non-bank financials. I'm not worried about so much about the risks we see. I'm worried about the risks that we don't see. And that's what the lesson is for me, one of the big lessons of the financial crisis, that we were running far more risk than we were recognizing. Um, and I want to make sure that doesn't happen again. Okay. You know, I actually lived in Texas during this period, and I remember getting a mortgage in late 2007. It was fairly easy. And one of the takeaways I got, at least from the state of Texas, is they had um, regulations in place that prevented some of the excesses or the worst parts of the housing boom from getting into Texas. You know, I, I know from the uh, – my understanding is at least from the, the uh, housing boom bust in the 80s, from the oil-related – boom bust cycle there. Texas put in place some laws, for example, that prevented one from getting a 120% mortgage. And I wondered if there's any lessons there. 
Of course. And I think what we also learned uh, is in 2006, which was a good year in the United States, you're right? Yep. Uh, if you look at the household sector in this country, uh, the household sector uh, was extremely hist- extremely leveraged, meaning if you took household debt divided by gross domestic product for the households, there was a very high le- degree of leverage. The reason we didn't notice it is if you looked at household debt relative to asset values, it actually didn't look excessive back to home prices. Yep. And so what the housing crisis exposed is a lot of households were dramatically over leveraged, but they were comforted by the fact that uh, there were easy mortgage conditions and home prices were very high. Obviously, I don't need to remind people in the houses, housing uh, sector collapsed. Uh, all of a sudden, the household sector was clear were very highly leveraged and they spent the last eight or nine years deleveraging. So I think one of the lessons also, which relates to mortgage uh, availability um, and so on, was we've got to watch the health of the household sector. Even with that, the aggressiveness on mortgage offerings were probably the tip of the iceberg. It's all the securitizations upon securitizations okay. upon securitizations of those mortgage obligations, which magnified those excesses. If we didn't have all the securitizations on top of uh, this aggressive mortgage lending, it still would have been painful, but it wouldn't have been anywhere near as painful as what ultimately happened. And this kind of goes back to the point you made earlier about nominal GDP targeting. Again, in a different world, a counterfactual world where we did have a nominal GDP level target. This would have made that crash a whole lot uh, nicer or less less severe. Well, truthfully, and I'll give – I wasn't at the Fed, so I, I'm, I've been at the Fed only three years. Yeah. I, I actually probably have a slightly different take. I think there's a, there's a number of things we do at the Fed. One of them is monetary policy, but another big one is macro prudential policy. And I think if you don't have good macro prudential policy, it's very difficult to run a uh, sensible – it makes monetary policy harder. Okay. And so I think we need to do both. I, you, could, you could debate, and I've been part of those debates, to question uh, monetary policy leading up to the crisis, approaches for monetary policy. Uh, but I think if if, if – if you don't have good macro prudential policy for, again, stress testing, monitoring of the non-bank financials, I think it makes it, uh, it, it, makes it very hard to avoid instability. That, that's a fair point. But if you did have those imbalances build up, let's say, for the sake of argument, you did have that leverage. I mean, the, I think the point you made earlier is that a nominal income target, a nominal GDP target, though, would make the unwinding of that leverage much more manageable. Is that fair? Listen, what I've learned is if the uh, household sector gets over leveraged, uh, you've got to accept it's going to take a number of years for households to deleverage. They're not not like companies who can sell assets, raise equity, restructure, restructure their debt. Households can't do that. And um, I think the trick is a little bit of prevention. And I think we want to get in a situation where we monitor the household sector more carefully and try to take steps to uh, um, maybe moderate uh, excessive debt growth at the household sector relative to income. Okay. One last question, the time we have left. You mentioned earlier the fact that inflation for a good part of the past decade kind of undershot the the 2% target. There was an explicit target after 2012, kind of implicitly was there beforehand. And I wonder, what is your explanation for why um, inflation tended to fall below target for so long? So my my own view is that there were a number of headwinds which uh, were deflationary. One, the household deleveraging created a headwind for GDP growth. Uh, Secondly, automation uh, and to some extent globalization also have changed the balance of power where Pricing power of businesses today is much, much more limited than what it was even uh, 15 years ago. And what do I mean by that? The consumer now has in the palm of his or her hand more computing power today than most companies did 25 years ago. And that has changed the power balance uh, between uh, the consumer and business. 
And so I talked to lots and lots of businesses where they just do not have pricing power because consumers now much more easily technology enabled are able to shop at for lower price, greater convenience. And there's a whole series of disruptive uh, entrants into businesses and disruptive technologies for existing businesses that limit, create greater transparency, limit tri- pricing power, and, and uh, limit competition. And so I think those forces are not going away. If anything, they're accelerating. Uh, and those forces of automation and globalization are probably uh, deflationary. So um, my own view is I think we've seen a little bit of that over the last 10 years. I I think you can also argue maybe the Fed's done a good job in anchoring inflation expectations, but I think there are structural changes in the economy in the United States and globally, which may mute inflation, have a muted inflation and will mute it in the years to come. Okay. Well, on that note, our time is up. Our guest today has been Rob Kaplan. Rob, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you, David. Good to talk to you, sir. Macro Musings is produced by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. If you haven't already, please subscribe via iTunes or your favorite podcast app. And while you're there, please consider rating us and leaving a review. This helps other thoughtful people like you find the podcast. Thanks for listening.